So those are the announcements. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Giovanna Tinetti, who's Professor of <coughs> Astrophysics at University College London. Uh, I, most of you will have seen the flyer with a description of her work and uh, um, activities, some of which we'll hear about today. Let me just briefly say that Giovanna is of Italian origin. She did her first degree in uh, theoretical physics uh, in, in Turin. Uh, luckily, she saw the light and has moved into more respectable fields since. <laughs> She's worked in, in the US at the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, and in Paris, and around 10 years ago, we were able to lure her to this country and she's established a, a world-leading research group in uh, uh, the field of exoplanets at UCL. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Giovanna Tinetti. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today and to guide you through a virtual tour of the planets in our own galaxy. But uh, I would like to start our journey from a planet that you, you should be quite familiar with. It's our home, it's our Earth. And the Earth as a planet is a quite interesting one. It's a rocky type of planet uh, with a bulk composition of silicates and iron. And uh, we have an atmosphere on top of that, so the gaseous envelope that is mainly made of uh, molecular nitrogen. And then on top of molecular nitrogen, we have traces of water vapor, carbon dioxide. But what is really peculiar of the composition of the Earth's atmosphere is the high concentration of molecular oxygen and ozone. Uh, the reason why it's peculiar is because molecular oxygen in particular is very reactive gas and we shouldn't have 21% of our own atmosphere being made of this particular <coughs> gas. And the reason why we have such a high concentration is because there was life on Earth that developed about 3.8 billion years ago and uh, the increase in the concentration of oxygen throughout the development of, uh, of, the, of life on Earth uh, uh, has brought us to this 21% today. So there is this constant source of molecular oxygen through a life that is uh, um, living in our own planet. If we zoom out of, uh, and we're looking at what is happening in our own solar system, we are looking at here at a synoptic view of all the planets around our own uh, sun. And as you can see here, we have uh, the uh, a more rocky, a solid, smaller planet, uh, uh, in particular Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars, which are located more in the uh, internal part of our own solar system. And a third away, we have the gas giant, Jupiter and Saturn, that as you can see from this picture, they're much bigger. And in fact, they're weighing uh, about uh, between 100 and 300 times the mass of the Earth. And third away, we have Uranus and Neptune that on the contrary are the icy giants uh, that have a mass uh, that is about uh, 15 times the mass of the Earth. Mm. Apart from the mass, they are very, very different words because uh, if we're looking at the gaseous envelope around these planets, even among the terrestrial planet here, they all have a very similar bulk composition. They're all made of silicon and iron, but actually the atmosphere is very different. And if we're looking at Mercury, Mercury doesn't really have an atmosphere, very, very, very thin one. Um, uh, Venus, on the contrary, has a very thick atmosphere made of carbon dioxide and some sulfuric acid cloud. It's not very, not very nice environment to be in. Uh, well, we already talked about the Earth, and Mars, on the contrary, has a very thin atmosphere made of carbon dioxide. And this is very thin because actually Mars is a relatively small planet compared to Venus and the Earth, and so it was lost through time because of the low gravity. Um, all the other icy and gas giant planets have uh, an atmosphere that is mainly made of molecular hydrogen and helium, which were the most common uh, uh, molecules uh, in the protoplanetary disk where these planets are forming. And so as you can see, already our own solar system with eight planets is, uh, uh, is, is suggesting a lot of variety. Let's zoom out again, and now we're looking at our own galaxy, the Milky Way, 
And in the Milky Way, our solar system is located here in one of these external branches, so I should say a rather uh, unfashionable area of our uh, galaxy. And in our galaxy, we have about 100 billions of stars, more or less. Uh, what I think is one of the most revolutionary uh, uh, message that uh, we have uh, learned in the, past re uh, in the past years is that on average, we know that statistically, every star in our galaxy hosts a planet. Again, this is a very recent statistic that comes out of statistic of missions like Kepler and other surveys from the ground. And so you should imagine that our galaxy probably has at least hundreds of billions of planets which is uh, quite scary, I should say. But if we zoom out again, now we're looking at our own universe, and at that, this point, uh, we're looking at hundreds of billions of galaxies. And so if all these galaxies is a similar statistic compared to the Milky Way, then we're really thinking of billions of billions of planets in our own universe. Now, I'm afraid we don't know yet billions and billions of planets. But for the moment, we are counting 3,500 exosolar planets in our own galaxy. So I'm afraid it's not as impressive as hundreds of billions. But I think this number is, is still very, very impressive. If you think that basically uh, before the 90s, uh, nobody knew where, where were planets were really existing in our own galaxy. And uh, this, this artist's view of this exosolar planet is conveying the, the key message that I want to bring to you today. There is a huge diversity among these planets in our own galaxy. Again, this is just a pictorial view, but uh, the artist actually has captured very well the fact that uh, planets of all sorts of sizes and masses are existing in our own galaxy. And typically, they have uh, different distances from their own star. Um, they, they have different orbits, and all together means that we're, we can think of very, very diverse worlds. So just uh, talking about the size, here we have a family portrait of the solar system planets. And uh, so as you can see, we have mainly three classes of objects in terms of sizes. But actually, how there in our galaxy, it looks like one of the most common size is uh, somewhere in between the Earth size and the size of Neptune. And these are objects that we call super-Earths, so basically objects uh, with masses between the Earth mass and the tenor masses. And this seems to be among the most common in our galaxy. This is a statistic um, distribution that comes out of the Kepler satellite in particular. And as you can see, basically, you have a peak in the statistics uh, for planets which have a radius that is uh, uh, smaller than five hair radii, which is more or less where the uh, Neptune radius is. And so basically we have many more small planets in our galaxy compared to the uh, 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 gas giant one. And this is counterintuitive because from observational perspective it's actually much easier to find these guys here rather than this, this small one here. But this seems to be so numerous that we're finding more and more. Now, what are exactly these super-Earths? Well, we know very little about these objects, and one of the reasons for that is that we don't have a super-Earth in our own solar system unless this planet 9 uh, is, is, is real. Um, and so for the moment, we start to have information about the density uh, uh, for some of these uh, uh, objects. So what you're looking at here is a diagram where here you have the mass of the planet expressing Earth masses, and here you have the radius of the planet expressing Earth radii. And all these uh, colorful um, uh, uh, crosses are basically indicating some planets that have been found with some particular masses and radii. And so basically we're looking at a density type of diagram. And then we have models that are suggesting what could be the bulk composition of all these dots, which are planets. Now, one problem is that uh, models um, can sometimes explain uh, maybe uh, more than one model can explain some of these observations, and so to a degree we don't really know exactly what is the bulk composition of these planets. And on top of that, we have objects that, uh, on the contrary, models cannot really capture. So bottom line, density is interesting as a first uh, uh, order uh, to understanding what's going on there, and so to know whether we're talking about a more rocky type of planet 
or a lighter sort of structure. But then beyond that, uh, uh, our knowledge really falters. Now, I've been uh, using for the next slides, actually, some pictures that are coming out of some of the most recent movie, more science fiction movie, because I think, actually, they, they are quite good in capturing some of the characteristic of some of the super Earth. As I said, we don't know for sure, but certainly uh, uh, the category of the classes of water wards that has been uh, um, uh, portrayed in the film Interstellar in this particular way, so with a planet with a very big ocean, uh, we, we think that actually there are some exosolar planets like that. So basically, uh, exosolar planets with uh, a surface that is uh, covered by oceans. And so possibly this planet Miller, as it was uh, uh, included in the film Interstellar, is a good approximation for uh, planets like Kepler 22b and other very similar objects. Another uh, planet out of the Interstellar movie uh, for uh, showing what high sea worlds uh, might look like. We have many exosolar planets that are located so far away from the star. They receive very little light and they're presumably extremely cold or quite frozen. And so perhaps this planet man from Interstellar is actually a very good approximation for some of these planets uh, which have been discovered from microlensing and other techniques. We also have many super Earths uh, that are located so close to their star that they complete one revolution around the star in less than one day. So basically they're sitting on the star. And that means they have temperature over 2000 degrees Celsius. And with temperature like that, the surface of the planet is probably molten. And that's why we're calling them in jargon these uh, lava words. And again, I'm using at this point Star Wars and the planet Mustafa to show what they might look like. And uh, again, from Star Wars, uh, this is a nice picture of the uh, planet Tatooine uh, that uh, in the movie had two suns. I'm afraid it's not science fiction because uh, Kepler in particular has find, found a long list of planets which are orbiting around two or even three stars. So it looks like planet uh, Tatooine <laughs> might not be uh, really so science fiction. And finally, um, uh, the, uh, the film Avatar was actually very trendy in showing that uh, uh, you might have a habitable hexamoon. This is the Pandora from out of the movie. And although we don't know whether there is a Pandora or not yet, we, uh, we are hunting uh, very fiercely for exomoons uh, um, uh, today. And so perhaps very soon we will have a long list of exomoons as well. So I use a science fiction movie to, uh, to sort of convey the message that what we are finding out of this planet, it's at the limit of science fiction. And we were certainly not uh, predicting such a diversity of words out there before starting this journey. And if you think that all this is quite impressive, in the next 10 years, there is a long list of space mission that will be launched by NASA and the European Space Agency to find even more planets. A mission like Isa Gaia, Plato and Cheops, or NASA Tess and Kepler will find thousands of thousands of new planets in the next decade. So we really need to be prepared for that. And of course, it's great to collect planets, but uh, these are not stamps. And so to a degree, we also have a scientist as human being also have our questions. And in particular, we're asking what are exoplanets made of? What's the weather like there? Why are they so diverse? How do they form? How are they habitable? So we have all these questions that we want to answer. And one way to start to put some uh, answer to this question is to look at the gaseous envelope that is wrapping uh, this planet. And the reason for that is the chemistry of the atmosphere of a planet um, can, can be used to trace back all the physical and chemical processes during the formation and evolution of the planet. And in particular, the formation is very important. And of course, uh, depending what kind of elements were collected during the formation process, where the planet formed, clearly uh, has a huge impact in the atmospheric <laughs> chemistry. Uh, where, where there were some impacts uh, with some other bodies during the history. Uh, we believe that the moon was formed uh, uh, out of a big impact uh, um, between the Earth and a big object in the solar system. So you can imagine that this 
can have a quite dramatic effects. <coughs> Uh, whether there are clouds in the atmosphere, so whether some uh, species are condensed out or in a gaseous form. Of course, the interaction with the star uh, can, uh, can have a, a, um, a pretty dramatic effect. If there are some escape processes, so whether some species are lost at the top of the atmosphere. Um, if there are some volcanic activity, so whether there are some uh, molecu molecular species which have, uh, uh, have been outgassed through the history of the planet in the atmosphere. And finally, life, of course, uh, can dramatically uh, really change uh, the atmospheric composition of a planet. And I mentioned at the beginning that the amount of uh, oxygen and ozone that we have in the Earth's atmosphere is, uh, is a clear signature that this can happen. <coughs> So how we can look at this atmosphere? We're talking about planets which are several uh, tens, and in some cases even hundreds of light years away. So as you can imagine, it's very difficult. But we have a couple of techniques that today are being used and are very successful in trying to understand what is the chemical composition and structure of this atmosphere. And in particular for planets which are transiting, so planets that are passing in front of the star, uh, what you're looking at here, I'm afraid, is not an extrasolar planet. It's actually the Sun and Venus. You're looking at the transit of Venus, and this is Venus that basically uh, is transiting in front of the Sun. Uh, but the kind of technique we're using for exoplanets is exactly the same. The only difference here is that the star is not this big sphere. It's a, a very tiny dot because it's very far away but we still can use uh, the uh, measurement uh, of the decrease in light when the planet is passing in front of the star to work out what is the size of the planet compared to the size of the star. And we can do even better. So not only we can measure, again, the size of the planet when the planet is passing in front of the star, we can al also basically look at the uh, very thin limb that is due to the atmosphere, uh, around the planet and basically um, split the light that is coming from that very thin annulus into wavelengths or colors. And if we do that, we start to uh, record what we call in jargon spectra, which are basically this type of modulations. And this spectra basically can tell us what are the molecules and atoms and ions that are absorbing in an atmosphere. And the reason why we can do that is that we know that each molecule, each atom, has a very specific way of absorbing and emitting light. And so when we record a spectrum like this one here, then we can compare to the data that we can obtain in lab or we can model and work out whether there is water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide, and so on and so forth. So this uh, a kind of method has uh, proven really very successful. I'm going to show you just a few examples because I'm conscious of time. In particular, with space telescope like, satel like Spitzer and Hubble, uh, now a, a few tens of uh, uh, Jupiter type of planets, relatively hot because they're located very close to the star, have been measured using this kind of techniques. And of course, the spectra are not as beautiful as the one that uh, I've shown you before. They still have a lot of uncertainties. Uh, but still, the fact we are able to, uh, to do this kind of measurements today for planets which are very far away, I think it's, uh, it's a proof that this technique can work. And certainly, the water signature seems to be quite ubiquitous among the uh, uh, Gastrion planet or Neptunes that have been looked at until now. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, people are also able to look at the thermal properties of the planet by basically doing similar measurements while the planet is basically orbiting around the star, and so work out what is the temperature distribution on the planet while the planet, again, is orbiting around the star, and then work out what is the chemistry uh, depending on what uh, point of the orbit we're looking at. And also in this particular case, we're looking at uh, water absorption. But of course, there are other molecules that have been detected, some carbon-bearing species like uh, uh, carbon monoxide or methane, some uh, um, atoms such as sodium and uh, potassium and so on and so forth. Um, I have a couple of more examples about super Earths because, uh, as I said, these are very, very interesting planets, and we don't know whether they're more rocky 
or something in between uh, rocky planets and Neptunes. And for the moment, the most famous one is GJ1214b, which is a planet that is uh, about 6.5 or masses and a temperature that is around 250 Celsius. Now, this particular planet is, uh, is still a mystery for all of us because it has been observed in no possible way. And the kind of observation that we're finding are suggesting a relatively flat sort of spectrum, so very tiny or no modulations. And this kind of uh, a signature can be interpreted either with the presence of clouds, so a very opaque type of atmosphere, or uh, an atmospheric composition that is actually uh, heavier than hydrogen, and so the light has some problems in going through easily in the atmosphere. So bottom line, we still need to observe uh, more this planet, another similar one. More recently, at UCI, we looked at another super Earth, which is very hot, uh, 55 Cancri here with a temperature of about 2000 Celsius, so really, really very hot. And uh, to our surprise, we found out that uh, the planet does have an atmosphere on top of it, and it was not given, uh, given the temperature and the vicinity with the star. And this uh, uh, atmosphere seems to be quite volatile, and so presumably there is still some hydrogen in. And so we, we clearly want to repeat this kind of measurement for more and more planets, and I guess the living now are more the kind of uh, um, observatory that we can use today. Um, I mentioned a second technique, and actually the second technique is direct imaging, and this particular technique has been recently extremely successful using instruments from the ground to do basically uh, images like this. This is actually the real planet, it's not an artist's view. This is the planet and this is the star, uh, and the light from the star has been blocked with a coronagraph. And here we are seeing the planet in a different moment throughout the orbit. So I think this image really is, uh, is fabulous, and the fact that images like this are more and more common really show how many progress uh, people have been doing with this kind of techniques that is really, really very, very difficult. And so I'm showing another example in this particular case that's another young Jupiter, a large separation. Large separation because with this technique, uh, Contrary to transit, we're more, uh, um, uh, we're better at looking at planets which are really far away from the star because it's much easier to block out the contribution of the star itself. And for this particular uh, planet, 51 Eridani b, not only the planet has been identified with this instrument on, uh, on, on Gemini, but actually the light has been split into multiple wavelengths and colors like you've seen for transiting planets. <laughs> And as you can see, this modulation seems to suggest a number of molecules like water and, and methane. So again, also with this kind of techniques, we're able to do wonders. So what we should expect for the future? Well, Hubble and Spitzer have been fantastic, really, and also ground-based instruments like Sphere and GPI. I show you some of the results uh, today. Um, but uh, uh, in 2018, a very big telescope will be launched. It's the James Webb Space Telescope, 6.5 meters in diameter, and doing fabulous spectroscopy in the infrared. So, of course, we will do our best to use most of the time that we can with James Webb to do this kind of measurement. And from, from the ground, a extremely large telescope, a 30-meter telescope, will we'll come and see first light probably 10 years from now or so. But certainly something that uh, I, I, I personally put a lot of effort on and also our scientists are looking into is the possibility of having dedicated satellites for doing this kind of measurements because it's great to have a general facility but you uh, also want to be able not just to do the very best uh, and cherry picking them on this planet but really do a large population of objects. And so I will spend uh, uh, just a few slides to, to tell you what uh, we have been working on. One possibility that uh, uh, we have been considering is the aerial space mission concept. Uh, we propose to European Space Agency a mission concept for a one meter telescope in L2. L2 is actually a particularly stable point at 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And from that very stable point, one could look between 500 and 1,000 exosolar planets and doing uh, measurements like the one you've seen and really try to understand the atmosphere of these planets. 
So these are the kind of measurements that we're dreaming about if we can have a mission like Aerio and really work out what are the components, the thermal structure, weather, about uh, hundreds uh, of planets. Um, Aerial is uh, a concept that has been put together with the uh, contribution of 12 European countries. And as you can see here from the map, uh, you have all the different contribution. Uh, the UK is actually leading the aerial effort and uh, um, we are clearly very interested in this kind of uh, measurements. Um, but of course, uh, Ariel, uh, if, if deselected, because it still needs to go through a final selection, it will be launched uh, um, at least 10 years from now. So in the meantime, can we do something? And so with our people in the UK, we started to look at a, a potential mission concept called Twinkle uh, in collaboration with Surrey Satellite. Surrey Satellite is a very successful company in Surrey. Uh, that uh, is uh, building uh, satellites uh, for Earth observations. And so uh, by working with them in the past couple of years, we started to look at the possibility of repurposing some of their satellites rather to look down at the Earth, to look up at all the stars and planets. And the concept we came up with is a 50 centimeter telescope that could be launched in low orbit. And we just finished now basically the phase A study uh, with the collaboration of many institutes in the UK. And we found out that this indeed is feasible. Potentially, if we come up with the budget, we could launch it in three years' time. And with a cost, this is that's less than one-tenth uh, of the uh, other mission that I just presented. So this is the kind of twinkle timeline for a very aggressive and ambitious sort of timeline. Uh, but uh, for the moment, we are on time. Uh, technically speaking and scientifically speaking, everything is going uh, very well. And as I said before, apart from Surrey Satellite, there is the participation of Open <coughs> University, UK ATC, Rod Space, Cardiff, UCL, MSSL, and Celex. So um, the difficulty, of course, of Twinkle is to find uh, basically the budget. And uh, uh, the, the kind of budget we're talking about uh, is somewhere in between 47 and 50 million pounds. And of course, uh, as I said, it's less than 10% of uh, is a medium-sized mission, but it's still a lot of money. And so we are looking into uh, various funding sources that are including uh, potential government fundings or philanthropy, and uh, finally also sale of telescope time, so a more commercial type of solution uh, um, globally, so worldwide. And so at the moment, we have uh, uh, business managers that are literally travel traveling all around the world to try to understand where there is uh, an interest from scientists around the world to participate to an adventure like this. And indeed, the results are quite promising. I should also say that uh, um, Twinkle has uh, an educational program that now has a life of its own. And you can find a lot of this information on the Twinkle website. We are engaging a lot with school educational programs in the UK to make sure that if a mission like Twinkle is launched, then the uh, uh, basically kids from a very early age up to students at high school can really be part of this great adventure and uh, uh, suggest the planets we can observe, look at the data, really work with scientists to be part of this uh, um, great adventure. So my last slide before the conclusion is this one. I mentioned habitable words, so I think I need to at least uh, a touch uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this point. I think in the next decade, the only, um, w the only kind of objects that we might be able to look at in terms of uh, uh, candidate habitability are super rares around the stars which are colder and smaller than the sun, uh, what we call uh, in astronomy and dwarfs. And the reason why these objects are actually very interesting one is because, first of all, they're very numerous because there are many um, cool dwarfs out there. And then uh, uh, um, an increasing number of super Earths have been found uh, recently around this, this type of stars. And given that uh, the star is very cold, this planet uh, to be uh, in a temperature uh, that is compatible with life needs to be relatively close to the star, meaning that you can presumably use transiting methods to look at their atmosphere, composition, and temperature. And so this long list of, uh, 
of planets around cool dwarf might be um, observable with James Webb. I think James Webb has the right characteristic to look at those planets. And so hopefully very soon we might have at least uh, some preliminary information about uh, this kind of planets. I think I use most of my time, so I think it's uh, time to wrap up to conclusion. And actually my conclusion is going back to the kind of question that I started at the beginning. Uh, a long list of questions about this exosolar planet. Billions of words in our galaxy, billions of billions in our universe, and all these questions, what are they made of? What's the weather like they, they're, Why are they so diverse? How are they habitable? And I hope that in the next decade, new space mission, new observatory, will help us starting to address all this question. And although this is the end of my talk, it's really just the start for this very interesting and amazing field that is exosolar planets. Thank you very much. So thank you very much indeed, Giovanna. Um, I should just add uh, that I think she's been slightly <laughs> modest because in describing the two space missions that we hope to fly, you use the royal we, but I think it's true that you are leading both of those projects. Well, there is a, there is a lot of effort and work, especially from young generations, uh, so I shouldn't really take all the credit here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have lots of time for Q&A. Um, there is supposed to be a microphone, but I think we finished so early that the microphone hasn't appeared, so we'll try and work without it. Okay, so let's start over here. Getting... Um, well, uh, my question, uh, take me a few a minutes maybe to ask it. 30 seconds. It's believed that um, the most likely place in the solar system to find life is Europa, one of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. However, Uh, this is a great question. I'm not really sure I have an answer to that. Uh, certainly, uh, Europa, like our satellites, our moons of the giant planets, are extremely interesting places, as you're saying, for uh, possibility of finding life. Um, whether life is really there or not, I guess nobody can really know at this point. John, maybe you, you're kind of working on these kind of moons, so you might have... Uh, your own view on that. Yes, but well, maybe I can make a little comment. I mean, my interest is studying our own solar system with spacecraft actually going there. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that there is a race to find, the, you know, the first absolute uh, proof of life. But uh, if there is, I hope it's, you know, Europa or Ganymede or uh, even, even Mars, you know, is, is certainly not ruled out for, for, for primitive life. I mean, absolutely nobody knows. There's enormous amount of research and literature about the possibility of life in all sorts of environments. It's, it's, it's all speculative. I mean, I think during my career, the thing that has really struck me is how the environments in which life can, can exist has has expanded, if you like, just from research on Earth. You know, we, we, we thought life was actually quite delicate and could only exist in a rather sort of narrow range of temperatures and pressure and acidity and so on. And, and you know, we now find life in the most horrible environments here on Earth, which, you know, when you extrapolate that, um, it, it, I guess, um, increases the likelihood of, of finding life in... In, in I think my argument is that, um, um, admittedly, there's a whole range of environments in which life can exist, uh, but that doesn't mean that life can start in all those environments. Uh, it's most likely to start in one specific environment or a, a, a 
small number of them. Um, and once it gets going, it can then spread. Um, yeah, look, we need... We, we need to move on. We need to move on. S sir. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, have you got a, a, a clear idea or a, a, a great scheme as to how you would de devise a way of identifying life on an exoplanet? Uh, well, I think uh, the only scientific sort of methodology that for the moment people are discussing is the one that was proposed by Lovelock already uh, a few years ago, I should say. So it's not really such a novel one. And Lovelock suggested that technique already for looking at uh, the uh, possibility of having life on Mars. So basically he suggested looking at the atmosphere of the planet to look for signs of disequilibrium chemistry and uh, this disequilibrium chemistry could be brought by life because, for instance, in our own Earth, we have so much oxygen which is completely out of equilibrium because there is life that is pumping oxygen in the atmosphere. And so perhaps on another planet, one could think of a very similar mechanism and so search for disequilibria in a sense. Uh, I think this is the only definition, the scientific definition of the moment we have said that uh, there's uh, a long list of planets that we started to look at uh, that clearly are not habitable because we're talking about extreme temperatures. Uh, but they are so diverse that we're really starting to learn about the chemistry and how this planet behaves in all sorts of extreme environments. So little by little, I think the kind of question of habitability is sort of uh, shifting forward. Uh, because I think, first of all, we need to understand the simpler objects, and hot objects typically are simpler, before we get, even from a theoretical perspective, into the uh, more complex environment that could potentially host life. Can I just ask whether biologists are involved in the discussion? They certainly are involved. Uh, I mean, now the, the field of astrobiology is, uh, is a, has a global interest, I should say. So, of course, they are involved. At the same time, even for biologists, they are uh, clearly they have a great knowledge of life as it is on Earth. But we have no guarantee that life is exactly the same on another planet. So, to a degree, uh, what we, we still need to find out is whether how many environments are out there that are similar to our own environment. And uh, perhaps if we can start to look at thousands of planets out of these thousands, then there will be something that just uh, uh, catch our eye, our attention, because it's, uh, it's something different from the rest. This, this is my personal hope, that after the, we, we got the big picture, then we can start to look for the um, peculiar cases. Could I ask a follow-on, just just quickly? Um, and this is probably stupid. You'll tell me, I hope. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it's science fiction, but I'm sure I've read about, um, you know, if you have a long-lasting civilization on a planet, is it not possible that they could give an imprint onto the atmosphere through things like pollution or nuclear wars or, you, you know, human activities which... Which, which do something to the atmosphere which might be observable. Uh, is that it, crazy? No, no, it's not crazy at all, but the kind of signature we're talking about <laughs> are so small that then it's certainly not the in the next decade we're talking about. We're so that talking is, about. it is science fiction. It's, it, for, for the now, moment. For now, yeah. Okay, well, the, the microphone has appeared. So, Annette, down at the front here. Thank you for your marvellous talk. I've just got two questions, but they're related. One is, how comfortable do you feel extrapolating? Um, you mentioned each planet, an average a star. Outside our galaxy, how comfortable do you feel extrapolating that information? Um, and secondly, could you say a word or two more about the activities forecast for James Webb Telescope? Thank you. Absolutely. Well. I think to, to a degree extrapolating the kind of statistical um, results from our galaxy to others, I don't think that is too dangerous because I don't think that our galaxy is special at all. 
So on average, I would expect very similar sort of characteristics. Um, in terms of James Webb, uh, of course, James Webb will be uh, uh, clearly the next generation of space telescopes, uh, and it has been conceived to look at uh, actually uh, uh, very ancient galaxies, so really look at the boundary of the universe as we know it. So we'll have very, very sensitive instruments on board. But some of these instruments might also be used to look at exosolar planets, uh, and I think where the kind of uh, um, uniqueness of uh, James Webb will certainly uh, to be able to look at smaller planets and colder ones, like these uh, super Earths around this uh, relatively cool star. Because for that, you really need to have a big mirror and uh, um, a, a large collective area and also be able to go in the infrared, as James Webb will do. Uh, the kind of uh, more dedicated mission I was talking about so will certainly focus more on very bright stars and, and uh, mainly on uh, hot and warm objects. So to a degree, uh, I think this is, this is the kind of division that uh, one could conceive. Thank you so much. The, the problem is, is it not for people who are perhaps not familiar, is that all of the world's astronomers will be trying to get time on the James Webb, so it will be... <laughs> it, we will it, need 10 James Webb, I yeah. think. <laughs> okay. Over, over here. You mentioned, I think, the orbits of uh, exoplanets. They've been measured and so on. Um, does that mean... Um, we know about the stars, which they're orbiting, and the axes, is, the axes of spin, and so on. Uh, if excellent you, if question. If you do know, do they, do they match up? Uh, excellent question. Yes, we have a lot of information about the orbits of these planets, uh, and they didn't have time to, to, to go <coughs> into that direction. Uh, in particular, for planets which are transiting, so they pass in front of the star, then at that point, so out of the transit like of so the information of the star and the planet together, you can extract a lot of information about, uh, about the orbit. And uh, well, also with our techniques, but certainly for transiting planet even, even more. And uh, what we found out, for instance, that is quite uh, uh, impressive is that uh, planets in our own solar system are orbiting mostly in a circular orbit. Uh, out there, about 60% of the planets found are in very eccentric orbit, uh, suggesting that presumably when they're being formed, they go through a more dramatic process where possibly there are some collisions. And so many of the planets we're looking at uh, are in very eccentric orbit, meaning they are very elliptical sort of trajectories. And so like comets, they spend maybe a lot of time away from the star um, and then, on the contrary, for a small amount of time, they, uh, they come very close to the star and they warm up. So very, very peculiar objects. Do you think um, when you accumulate all this, uh, all, all these measurements, it will tell us something about the origin of the galaxy? Because there are, there are enormous um, uh, streams of stars flowing around the galaxy, apparently. Well, certainly, um, I don't think that... There to be a relationship between that, that movement and stars. Uh, well, certainly, the mission Gaia that I mentioned before uh, and started to deliver the very first result would be really revolutionary to understand our galaxy in general and the star in our galaxy. And so I think Gaia will probably answer many of the questions we still have about our own galaxy. On top of that, Gaia will also find planets. But to a degree, finding planets is almost a, a consequence of the fact that we'll do all these precise measurements of the stars in our galaxy. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was wondering that if Kepler-22b is entirely covered in water, does that mean that bacterial life or other kinds of life, maybe plants with like boys on the front, could possibly live on uh, Kepler-22b's uh, surface? Look, that's an excellent question, and I can only answer with speculations at this point. 
Uh, for the moment, we don't really even know whether there is water on the surface of Kepler-22b. It's just that its density seems to suggest that, that in the interior, on top of these silicates and rocks, you also have some ices. And given the kind of distance to the star, perhaps at the surface you might have all this, this water. If the water is there, then why not speculating that uh, given the temperature of this particular planet that is relatively mild, why not speculating that you might have some sort of aquatic life forming? But again, it's, it's speculation at this point. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, I have two questions. The first one might be very quick. You mentioned at the end um, cool dwarfs and how there's an abundance of these. Is it possible that there could be a cool dwarf hosting exoplanets nearer to our solar system than Alpha Centauri because it's too dim to see? Um, and secondly, I was wondering, are there any efforts ongoing at the moment to directly observe exoplanets around the nearest stars to us using not transits but looking at the infrared spectrum that you can see from them? Uh, all excellent questions. Um, so for the moment, uh, Alpha Centauri, um, sorry, um, Proxima Centauri, which actually was, uh, uh, I mean, I, I took the picture out of the press release, uh, is certainly <laughs> one of the closest uh, star um, uh, that is hosting an exosolar planet is, quote unquote, just 4.5 light years away from us, so not really down the corner, but sort of. Um, I think is probably the nearest we can think of. Um, and uh, so I, I, I mean, I can't think of other stars which are closer than that, certainly with these uh, characteristics. Um, and then the other questions was about uh, the ability of doing direct imaging with these kind of planets. And I know that people are looking into the possibility of, of trying. Um, of course, when the planet is relatively close to the star, for direct imaging is a challenge um, because direct imaging, it's easier when the planet is uh, uh, relatively uh, far away, is more separated from the star. Um, and on the contrary, when the planet is very close to the star, it's easier with transit. So these techniques are quite complementary. And hopefully at a certain point, they will sort of join together in between, which is more or less the distance at which this planet have a temperature that is compatible with life. Uh, so whether we can do direct imaging for some of these stars uh, uh, relatively soon is an open question, but there is a lot of research going on because as you can imagine, there is a lot of interest. So people would do their best really uh, to push all the techniques to do, uh, to do that. Quick one from me. If you were living on that planet with two suns, and you mentioned three suns and so on, I mean, that would be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? It would be confusing, I yeah. guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can, you, can you describe some of the weird effects that you, you'd get? Um, yes. Well, first of all, it was not really clear whether planets could exist around two or three stars before Kepler started this long list of discoveries. And uh, the reason for that is that it's not obvious when you have three bodies that they are really stable. So it's the most general configuration, actually, they are unstable, and presumably one of them will just kicked out. And so typically, this kind of circumbinary planets, as they're called, are either uh, Either the two stars are relatively close to each other, and then you have a planet that is orbiting around the two, or they're relatively far away and they're orbiting just one of the, of the two stars. Um, so there are a, a few configurations that seem to be relatively stable, because the fact that we're seeing these objects, it means that they must be stable. Yeah. So you could be orbiting around one star mm -hmm. and, and then... Yeah. The whole thing orbiting about yeah. the second. Gosh, that would be interesting. Or around a two or star, yeah. which are then, of course, uh, orbiting around the center of mass. Right. Hi, Giovanna. Um, further on to the direct imaging, I was, there's been, seems to be quite a lot of missions which have been planned but haven't actually occurred or scrapped or something, the ones which are planned for the future. There was TPF and there was Darwin. I think there's Louvois, Habex, things like that. I mean, what are the chances um, which are specific for looking for terrestrial planets in their habitable zone? I mean, uh, what are the chances of these, one of these missions actually going ahead? How far away are we from doing them? 
Uh, excellent question. Actually, I started my career with TPF and Darwin, so to a degree, uh, I started with the idea that in order to get some signature out of the atmosphere, you needed to start with a very challenging, very big and expensive telescope. And to a degree, transit were a sort of a fresh air because they start to deliver uh, precisions in the measurement that were compatible with the observation of atmosphere and nobody to a degree at the beginning was expected that and so of course uh, we started to learn that actually you can do this kind of measurements not necessarily pushing some uh, technological development to this kind of a stream um, of course what we are doing today is not yet going to the habitable zone and taking imaging uh, uh, images of these planets and so that kind of question is still open um, at the same time, direct imaging is a, challenging, um, is a challenging method. And the very fact that today, for the first time, we have instruments from the ground that are delivering these fabulous images of giant planets, a large separation and spectra, to me is an incredible step forward for the technique. Um, what can we expect for the future? Well, first of all, I think one would need, technologically speaking, would need to demonstrate that you can do similar sort of measurement in space, not necessarily pushing right away to a Earth-sized planet, but you know, even just giant and uh, bigger planets. But being in space is an extra challenge because uh, you need to have a sort of adaptive optics um, in space, which is something that hasn't been yet uh, 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 proven. Um, there is a mission concept that at the moment uh, seems to uh, be uh, studied uh, quite a lot in the United States that is called WFIRST, uh, that among the options that is considering is to look in at uh, uh, direct imaging of exoplanets with a coronagraph on board, not necessarily going straight to the very small planet. And I think this is a, a, a quite a necessary step before we go into something that is immediately much bigger, much more expensive. I mean, for the TPF and the Darwin, one should remember that we're talking of billions. And so before you go in into billions, A, you need to have a science that is very solid. And when they were proposed, nobody knew about all these statistics that came out of Kepler and other. Um, and B, you need to have a technology that really is able to deliver uh, what you're asking. So I think that for the next decade or 20 years, if we are able to uh, progress by step with transit and direct imaging, both technologically but also scientifically, before we get, we put all our bets into a very small planet in the habitable zone, it might be a better procedure, um, even scientifically speaking, rather than just, just go to the, to the goal. And just to add a little comment, you talked about space projects which didn't happen. Most scientific space missions don't happen because uh, if we take the last European selection, for example, from memory, there were 38 missions proposed. And, you know, these are studied in great depth. And out of 38, one gets to fly. So most space projects never happen, sadly. Thank you for the talk. Uh, our own star and solar system uh, came along after two thirds of time had already passed, uh, and the debris that uh, accreted to form our inner planets had already gone through solar cycling. Any thoughts about change in composition of near star planets through time? Uh, so, throughout the history of the planetary system, and uh, 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 well, uh, of course, one uh, would expect that actually these planets are changing with time because certainly happened for the solar system objects, as you, you suggested, uh, and there were big changes. Um, what we're seeing today are uh, clearly not the same planets the, uh, that we, we, one could uh, observe at the beginning of the solar system and the formation of the solar system. And one would imagine is exactly the same for the planets around our stars. In fact, what we think uh, um, is that, uh, especially when we're looking at the gas giants, we see quite a, a variety of uh, sizes. Some of these planets are more puffed up. Some others, on the contrary, seems to be more similar in sizes and mass to Jupiter. Um, and possibly one of the reasons for this difference is maybe the age is different. 
And so when planets are being formed, there is more energy being released, and so especially the giant planet tends to be more puffed up, and then they sort of contract through time. And so the fact that we're seeing all that variety, maybe one of the reasons for that variety is also different age. Uh, and when it comes to terrestrial planets or super Earths, probably the difference is even, uh, is even uh, stronger because uh, if you're looking at a super Earth at the beginning of its career, uh, presumably you, you might still find a lot of hydrogen, which is the remnant of the, of the disk. But then through time, maybe you have our gassing processes and all these processes that I've sort of mentioned in, in one of my slides that will clearly change the entire composition. And so when we will observe these objects, of course, we will capture one moment in time of their history. And it will be a challenge also to understand in which moment of their history we're looking at. Um, so I'm going to ask you to speculate a bit more. Um, with missions such as Ariel and Twinkle, and you're going to be looking at the atmospheric composition, if you do find oxygen and organic molecules, how much more probable does that make that planet uh, to be habitable and to have life on it? Um, and in the same way, if you get a negative result and there isn't any of these building blocks of life, does that mean the planet will be sterile? And is there any way of or how sure can you be of a planet being habitable without actually going there uh, and finding out with a, a spacecraft? One minute. Excellent question. Uh, so, well, Ariel and Twinkle will focus more on warm and hot planets, so not necessarily habitable planets. But I will answer to your question independently from the kind of instrument that one might use for, for doing this kind of measurements. Um, it's, it's a great question. The, the problem today is that we have only one example of inhabited planet, and so we know that uh, oxygen and ozone are biosignature, but again, probably life is, uh, uh, is much more adventurous than just being the one that we know on Earth, and so that's why we're thinking of disequilibrium in the chemistry as a more generalized approach to look for biosignature. Um, whether we will find all this uh, disequilibrium in this planet or not is, is very speculative because I really would love to see the observation, and uh, uh, I bet that the observation will be even more interesting than all our theories. So I bet that, uh, to a degree, observation will be even more adventurous. Uh, could I also ask, um, what are the major limitations with our current uh, technology with regards to answering those questions on the board? And with things like James Webb, how much closer do you think we'll be to answering them? Um, it's, it's hard to say. Certainly, habitable planets are at the limits of the kind of instruments that uh, will be built in the next few years or will be launched in the next few years from space or, or from the ground. So in, in all cases, even James Webb or ULT, you will need to find the really favorable planet to do this kind of observations. So let's see. If they're very common and uh, the signature is very easy to, to probe, then of course it will happen. Otherwise, we will need to wait for the next generation for this sort of questions. Okay, I'm going to take the last question. It's about 20 years, isn't it, since the first exoplanets were, were observed. Should we be surprised that the Nobel Prize hasn't been awarded to the, the discoverers? I guess this is more a question for the Nobel panel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, we're all going to turn into pumpkins if we don't leave soon, I think. Uh, so, thank you all very much for coming, and on your behalf, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Giovanna Tinetti for a fascinating talk, and can we all thank her together?